Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, December 6. Today's topic is the Hour of Code. I'm Lori Moffitt, one of the co-moderators, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. And I'm going to turn the mic over now to Maureen, who will introduce today's special guests. Hi. I'm really happy to have Gail and Kevin join us today. I first met Kevin online back um, through Twitter back in March of 2008. I followed him and his electronic pencil blog to learn more about what he was doing in his classroom. EdTech was pretty new back then. Then in the fall of 2008, Liz Davis called me and asked if I would meet her for dinner because she was coming out to the western part of the state. She also contacted Kevin, and he contacted Gail. So I met them for the first time face to face at a restaurant for dinner. And when I went back the next day, I told my middle schoolers about some of the things Kevin was doing and that I just met him. And they were appalled that I had met someone in real life that I only knew online. So I told them that it was really OK. They were teachers and that I didn't go by myself, and I was a grown-up. It was OK. So later that spring, I got to go out to their school. And I visited Kevin and Gail in their classrooms. And it was so much fun to see what they were doing, integrating technology back in 2008 with laptops in their classrooms, projects. Gail's kindergarten class um, was just beginning the HERO project. And so these guys have been, and Gail was actually just starting out on as a uh, connected educator back then. And she has like just jumped in with both feet and grown in leaps and bounds over the years. It was so much fun to watch. So I've met up with Gail occasionally uh, at an ed camp. I see them online. And then I saw Kevin again this past fall, or last fall, when I was starting a new job. He was an instructor at a course at the school I was beginning my new job at. So when we were talking about Classroom 2.0 and a guest to invite, Gail and Kevin immediately came to mind. So Gail is a teacher with over 25 years in the classroom. She teaches kindergarten, and she loves to learn alongside her kids. She's taught at the William Norris School in Southampton, Massachusetts, for 14 years. Her classroom is a warm, inviting place full of activity. She's a wonderful resource and loves to learn and collaborate. Kevin also teaches at the Norris School. He was a 2014 nominee for the Digital Innovation in Learning uh, Sharing is Caring Award. He's a sixth grade teacher, a musician, a web comic creator, a presenter online at the K-12 online conference. He's the tech liaison with the Western Mass Writing Project. He also plays saxophone in the rock band Duke Rushmore. He's a wonderfully talented teacher with diverse interests, an amazing collaborator. No, I don't think he does sleep, Susie. Um, he shares his curiosity with his students, with his peers, and helps everyone dive right in, explore, reflect, and make connections to curriculum. So Kevin, I'm going to turn it over to you and Gail to do the newbie question. Thank you for coming and joining us today. Thank you, Maureen. Wow, that was a wonderful introduction. And um, it's, it's a great honor to be here uh, with all of you and also uh, to be able to collaborate with my colleague, uh, Gail. How are you, Gail? There? I'm great, Kevin. Yes, I don't like to leave the mic on. I might mutter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so the question, uh, the newbie question uh, for this session is, uh, what is coding? Um, and I think, um, you know, when I think of that question, I also think of the bigger question of uh, why do we code, too? Um, if we think of coding as uh, the building blocks of the technology that we're using in all sorts of platforms these days, um, it's the kind of underlying architecture of the way that we communicate and the way that we play and the way we do all sorts of things now uh, and how much the kind of world has changed and, and the programming that goes on under the code is kind of what 
our code is about, but not really. You know, people talk more about the idea of literacy connections and, and other things related to that. Um, but if we think of coding as uh, the underlying architecture of the technology we use, and there are people who program computers to make the code, um, and we, it's not always visible, so what we see is often an interface uh, kind of built on top of the code that allows us to interact with this technology in a way that's a little easier for most of us who don't know how to code. Um, and in thinking of that idea of the different um, different kind of programming languages too that are out there, and some are easier to use and learn than others. Um, and when we think of our students, uh, it's not that we necessarily want them to become programmers in their lives, uh, but we do want them to have an understanding of the technology that they're using. And I think a word I'll try to bring up a lot is agency here, um, of giving students the agency to use their technology in ways that make sense for them and not have it the other way around of thinking about technology kind of guiding them forward. Anything to add there, Gail? Uh, yeah, I, but I'm going to be touching on um, that connection myself later on and about how this is all about creating a form of communication. Um, and when we're talking coding on computers, we're talking about making a computer do something. But it comes all the way back to our brains and our thinking and how we're organizing and how we're expressing ourselves. And Kevin, you know, every time I've talked to you, I've gone back to pounding in the, the listening and speaking pieces and, as being the precursors to reading and writing. So I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. Um, I'm very excited to be working with you again today, Kevin. That's yeah, it's great to be here. Okay, so I guess we're going to move forward then. All right. Um, Sorry, I'll let you do it. <laughs> All right, I'll be I'll be the, the navigator here. All right. um, so this is uh, one of the one of the things we're going to be touching on today is that next week is the Hour of Code, um, which is um, a week long endeavor connected to um, um, Code.org and a lot of other uh, affiliated agencies to try to um, help teachers and help kids um, and actually even beyond that uh, help people think about coding and programming uh, as part of uh, the digital ways that we're living our lives these days. And so we're going to be talking a little about some of the things that we do in our classrooms. Um, and again, I'll be touching on this idea of trying to put more tools and more understanding in the hands of our students so that they have the agency um, that they don't always realize that they have. All right, so you know, one of the questions is um, why code? And uh, I just kind of want to refer to this book uh, by uh, Douglas Rushkoff. And he's done a lot of presentations uh, that you can find online uh, that talks about this idea of uh, program or be programmed. And part of the premise that he puts forth, which uh, when I read it, uh, really kind of resonated with me and kind of kept with me for many years, too, as I kind of work with my students, is this idea of um, how much uh, we are shaping our technology as opposed to how much are we letting ourselves be shaped by the technology. And I think, although it's a very complex idea, I think it's important that uh, students of all ages uh, you know, get entry into that in a, in a lot of different ways, uh, but really start thinking about the idea of, um, of us as people kind of using the technology in the ways that we kind of want it to work for us. Um, it doesn't always work that way, so sometimes uh, you know things are a little much, much more complex than we're kind of used to. But at least thinking through that critical analysis of of what's happening when I'm uh, interacting with this piece of technology, or if I'm on the World Wide Web, or um, on my mobile device, or working with this app, whatever it happens to be, you know, how can we think about our interactions with that particular piece of technology? And I think uh, you know, Rushkoff does a great job of kind of laying out the framework for the rationale of thinking about programming. And again, you know, his idea is not that we all need to become uh, computer programmers, but we should have an understanding of what's going on under the hood of the technology to have a better sense of what it is that we're doing and also, if it's not working for us, how we can make changes to make it work for us. And I, got, I guess I think a little bit of, um, of like car mechanics. Um, you know, I don't know a whole lot about um, engines and, and motors, uh, but I have a sense of how things work. So if something goes wrong, at least I can troubleshoot it and have a, you know, an idea of what I need to look for. 
And I think a lot of us don't really get that far with our technology. We kind of just let it be what it is and kind of work our sense around it as opposed to thinking about how to make it work for us. Jill, you want to add anything there? No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so we're moving on then. All right. Um, I'll take over on this one. Here's one of my slides. And it, the kids in this picture are now almost in Kevin's grade. They're in fifth grade right now, but that's them in kindergarten, back when we started using our laptops. Um, it's so easy to get kids' energy up for learning and to be tuned up for whatever we're going to do. They want to jump right into the fun. They, they're excellent listeners. Um, they make higher level thought connections when they work across the, um, your, when, uh, that will work across all of the curriculum. For instance, when the algorithm results in an unplanned event, the children mentally store that information and they correct their course. They may need to make the correction a number of times before they reach their intended outcome and move on to the next level. So like any other learning, this error may need to be revisited a number of times before they reach success. But they are thinking flexibly, and that's important in today's world. We're encouraging safe risk taking and perseverance in the classroom when we give them a higher level of rigor, more challenge, and they don't always have to win in order to find success and to grow. We want to build that growth mindset. Um, so that flexibility and keeping all of our learning both inside and outside of the classroom well-rounded is going to help us to be brighter and stronger students of life. So um, now we have another image. Uh, uh, these kids are also moved along in the years. Um, on this slide, the kids are creating their own design. Now that can be an important part of coding. Coming up with an event, in this case, the building that they're doing. Um, and that's how they are starting. So the coding comes in when they create the plan in a way that others can replicate it, can make it again. So this is where I want to make the leap into the language piece. How will they communicate the plan or the program for this event for others? In this picture, it would be a matter of looking at a model or a photograph and then following the directions as they see they should be done. But what if they couldn't use the picture or the model? They would need to use speaking or writing to communicate the program they developed in their minds. So Hour of Code teaches kids that the computer language tells the story by having them typing in the step-by-step -step command. So uh, the other piece that has to be mentioned here is that important collaboration that's going on. It's an important part of student learning uh, for the demands of our day, uh, both now and in the future, that the work we're going to be doing from here on out requires us to work well with others and learn to communicate with each other. Always an important piece. Anything you want to add to that, Kevin, before we move to the next slide? Uh, a couple things, actually. So in the last slide, if we just go back for a second, um, you know, you talked about perseverance. Um, and I know mm -hmm. in our school we've had um, discussions in the past couple of years about uh, trying to nurture perseverance with our students uh, when they get stuck in a math problem or whatever it happens to be and trying to teach them some of the skills to kind of to kind of move beyond that kind of stopping point. Um, and uh, certainly the idea of some kind of basic coding structure uh, kind of works that in. We, we'll talk about that in a little bit probably, but we saw it the other day, I think, when our classes collaborated on some hour of code activities um, where some teams kind of had to work through um, a hurdle and kind of keep moving forward um, and kind of what that looks like when you kind of introduce the idea of coding into that. Um, and then I also, uh, as you were doing this slide too, it really reminded me of um, there's a series of books that I'm just starting to read now uh, put out by um, um, the National Writing Project is one of the partners in MacArthur. Um, it has to do with systems design. Um, and one of the books is around uh, gaming, which is what I'm looking at right now. Uh, but it looks at this idea of learning as a kind of system approach and how when you change some of the factors and systems, it you know, changes the outcome. Um, so in life, you know, we think of like weather systems or political systems, uh, really kind of complex thinking. 
Um, but even, you know, these kids here playing with the blocks, you know, if you remove one of those blocks, you've changed that whole system of the structure there. Um, and I think that's that idea of the planning out and, the, and then the collaborative uh, element, too, of play, of how do we work together to build something we want to build and what happens when we change a variable in that. And so, you know, it moves beyond just the idea of coding here. I think it's, it's learning and literacy uh, that we're really kind of talking about, even though we're using the hour code as our kind of hook and anchor kind of into thinking and depending on how old your kids are, too, talking about what's going on really when we look at, um, you know, this kind of system approach. Mm -hmm. That's great, Kevin. And it reminds me, too, as you speak, that we have this blending that goes on in our heads that you teach a, a literacy program and I teach a kindergarten early childhood program and yet we're always thinking of the big picture and how this is all impacting our students, how they're going to learn and seeing those little pieces, much as these students are looking at the little pieces in their building right there, we are constantly rolling through this in our heads. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, you and I talk about it when we kind of bump into each other in the hallways, right? What's interesting at our school is that yeah. so I'm in sixth grade and you're in kindergarten is that you're at the, you know, the younger end of the scale in our school and I'm at the very oldest and, you know, we're kind of seeing, <laughs> seeing what happens over the course of the years, too, around technology and digital literacies and all sorts of different learnings. And, and um, it makes for an interesting, uh, you know, collegial atmosphere. It does. Let's move to 17, page 17. <clears throat> so this is me, right? Yeah. Yes, Kevin. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, as I've mentioned a couple of times, I think is that uh, one of the one of the reasons why I think about coding as um, as part of the literacy element is uh, to think about um, trying to teach the, our students a little bit about. Um, the idea of being under what's going on under the hood um, of the technology that they're using in their lives and kind of what it looks like. Uh, so this is a picture from last year's uh, Hour of Code. Um, and I guess we'll talk about some of their uh, activities in a few minutes. Um, but, you know, what I found in discussions with them afterwards is that there were some mixed reactions from students about the rationale for why we're actually we're doing Hour of Code. Um, and how it belongs in school. And I remember one student asked me, you know, how does this relate to writing? And um, actually that ended up, uh, I wrote a whole kind of piece for MiddleWeb uh, kind of based on that question of trying to, uh, you know, really kind of think through and articulate the reasons why coding belongs in an ELA classroom and why talking about programming and why video game design belongs in an ELA classroom. And, trying to think that through, um, not just the answer to the students, because that's important, but also for our parents, for administrators, and for myself, too, to kind of make it, make it, uh, make all those connections that we don't want to see writing and reading in this little box that we throw off to the corner of the room. Uh, you know, that those things are literacy, and our definitions of literacy have really kind of expanded out, I would argue. Um, uh, with the heart of certainly reading, writing, speaking, and listening, uh, but there's, you know, it, there's a lot more to it these days than ever before. And we want to make sure that we're touching on some of those things with the lives of our students so that uh, literacy is meaningful for them. And, you know, coding and thinking about programming is just one piece of that, I would argue. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so it's a consistent message that um, we're trying to communicate with someone, and that's all part of our literacy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, last year uh, when we did our Hour of Code, I tried to kind of capture um, some of the ideas and, and time that we spent and, and minutes and kind of programs that we use as part of that to make a little infographic. Um, and uh, last year we actually did a number of different programs to try to kind of get into that. Um, this year we're, we're, I'll talk more about it in a little bit, but we're kind of right kind of in the heart of our video game design project. Um, so that along with some of the activities in the Hour of Code will probably be our focus this year as opposed to other programs like Tinker um, and other ones that we tried out last year. Um, and what's nice though is that, you know, there are more and more apps out there, free apps 
um, and I know people have uh, compiled those in different places um, that um, help students um, use uh, logos programming and Blockly pro programming, you know, the click and drag Lego style uh, programming languages as a way to think about, um, again, the systems approach. When I change this, what happens there? Um, and how one piece of it uh, fits into the whole and all those kind of uh, sequential uh, programming ideas that may or may not take root in some of the kids and it's kind of hard to say. Um, but we don't want to lock them out of it either. Okay. So, you know, what concerns you most about taking and coding with your students? Um, we could take a minute here if time allows. Uh, uh, Peggy, I wonder what you think. If we should take the time now to stop and jot down some of your concerns that maybe can be addressed and be collected later on as Lori creates that last, um, the last page of things that we can revisit. Uh, what would you like to do here, Lori? Do you want to keep moving along? And Peggy, what do you think would be best? Should we stop to the whiteboard? Okay, um, so we we can we'll stop for a minute or two right here, and uh, you can use the tool that you see on the left hand side of the whiteboard, the A with the lines may be appearing, or the O oh, excellent. If those of you who need to be refreshed, it's the tool on the left with the A with the lines, or the large bold A, and you can use that. You can save those thoughts for later. Maybe not answer all of them right now. But there are lots of concerns that people have about taking on coding. And we're not afraid of saying those things out loud. It's all part of our own learning. A lot of teachers worry they don't know enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's, you know, that stops a lot of us, I think, from bringing in ideas into the classroom, which is I don't know enough to, to have my students dive into what's going on. And I think you know, when I talk to students about uh, teachers to about video game design, the same thing. You know that um, you know that the uncertainty about it, the kind of wariness about it, kind of holds back a, a lot of kind of thinking about whether this is right for the classroom. And I can see how coding and programming would be that. Um, certainly, though, the code.org people and their activities have really taken that into consideration. Another one here is having a limited coding background. And that reminds me that most of us are not computer science majors. And we're here as educators in one form or another, either as directly to computer science or within a classroom. And the code.org program, of course, is, makes it unnecessary for you to have a coding background. You can be highly successful without it. Yep, I think uh, another theme there is time, time in the school day, time in the school year, particularly balanced with uh, testing and, you know, all the kind of standards that we have to meet and kind of where that fits in. Um, and I don't think we probably have an easy answer for that. Uh, you know, the argument we can make is that if you look at the broad spectrum of what literacy is, it touches on a lot of different standards. Um, and gets kids to write, particularly if you have them reflect on what they're doing. I think that's, that, that can be a key writing piece, um, that you have them do an activity, and then the reflection is the kind of piece of writing where they're either making an argument or um, explaining what they're doing. Um, that there are ways to pull it in, but, uh, you know, you have to acknowledge the fact that um, some people have more flexibility for time than others. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about how you can get started on this. Someone asked that, and how you can get started in the early grades. You can ratchet it up a little more quickly for those students who have a little more experience. Um, and also speaking to having enough time to complete activities, that is a challenge. Somehow I managed to steal 20, 25 minutes of Kevin's time yesterday. We brought our classes together for collaboration in a magical way in that my students were working on Frozen, a much more challenging code.org program that they would not be able to find success with. But they sat with their sixth grade coding buddies and they saw some wonderful things, felt a real sense of accomplishment, and completed our code activities between that and little bits of work in our classroom as well. 
Yeah, and I think a number of the a number of their activities too will work really well on in, if you have an interactive board, so that it's not necessarily that every student has to be sitting in front of a computer. Uh, you know, we spent the other day about 15, 20 minutes before um, we met with our kindergarten friends, uh, going over some of the activities together, and kids were coming up and manipulating the whiteboard and and doing some of the uh, simple programming there because it's it's built nicely for that interactive element, um, which. Um, you know, helps I think if you're in a classroom where you don't have access to computers, and you know, we at our school have a couple of rolling carts, um, but there we're not we're not in abundance around computers, that's for sure. Um, but having activities you can do as a class, it can be valuable as well. Okay, Kevin, I think we can probably move on. Lori, I hope that this provides yeah. enough information for you. You're collecting that. Um, for some questions at the end that we'll be addressing then as well. So I'll move to the next slide, Kevin. Okay, so the Hour of Code, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, runs next week, uh, or the 8th through the 14th. You can see it on the slide there. This is just a screenshot from their home page. Uh, you know, we would encourage you to go to their home page at code.org and, and kind of see what's there. Um, they've added a lot more resources this year, but um, essentially what they have done is um, uh, set up um, a number of uh, video resources that are available to kind of share with students and parents. And I know one of the questions on the whiteboard was, um, you know, how do we explain this to parents? Um, but there are kind of ways to do that. Um, and then also on here, um, you can uh, sign up your class uh, if you want to, but it's not required. Um, and then there are a series of activities that really run the span from very uh, beginning uh, programming, uh, where you don't need any experience at all, to uh, you know much more advanced. Um, and I'll be curious when we do it this week a bit in class. Uh, I can already have a sense of some students who are um, who actually have some sincerity in some Java uh, script, which is you know not. I don't even have that. Um, and I'm curious of what you're <laughs> going to think of some of the activities on here to kind of see and you know what can they teach me about what they know about programming as well. Um, so I think having a wide range there is really, really helpful for teachers and students, uh, whatever your background knowledge is and whatever your kind of ability is around a program. You can come in here with no sense at all of what a code is and do a number of activities and come away with uh, at least a, a solid understanding of what kind of programming and coding is about, which is really a fantastic uh, resources that they put in place there for, for us and you know, for you. Um, this is their map from last year, uh, where they kind of mapped out um, the schools and programs and after school programs and community events um, that were doing the Hour of Code. You can see uh, you know, quite a number of, uh, of groups who are involved. Uh, I suspect there will be a lot more this year. Um, and Gail was just kind of sharing the other day how um, but Apple signed on and they're going to be running workshops in their Apple stores. Was that, was that what you saw, Gail? Yes, I did. That was Hadi Partovi who was um, sharing that Apple was doing it. And they're hoping to boost participation to 100 million students worldwide. Yeah, so that's, that's a lot of people that doing coding. Cool. <laughs> um, and, and you know another um, important yeah, go ahead. I just want to add one thing, Kevin. And that is that it says December 8 to 14, but don't hold it to that. This is not something that has to be done this week. This is something you can visit at any time. This is all free, and it's waiting for you all year long. I can go now and look at what last year's tutorials were. Apple and, and not Apple, but uh, code.org has provided all of this. Uh, code work for us to explore year round in our classrooms. So don't feel that you have to get into it this week. Maybe you feel more comfortable waiting until January. Go right ahead. It will be there. It will be ready for you. You will be part of the movement. And you will be part of the count as well. Yeah, that's that's really a great point. Um, and you know, talks to uh, the power of the web, right? That things can remain in place. Um, the lights don't go off uh, on that last day. On that kind of calendar, comes into play. Um, but I think it's it's uh, you know they set that the time period probably around uh, the uh, computer education week, I think. Uh, but yeah, we we went last year. We were in the springtime, kids are still going back and kind of moving through some of the levels of the games and and learning about coding too. So um, 
that's a really good point to know. That um, doesn't have to be this coming week to be whenever it works for you and your students. Um, or maybe certain students too, right? Um, you know, if you know some that right. need an extra challenge, um, this might be one of those activities that uh, pushes them a little farther uh, with uh, with uh, technology and literacy and reading um, and all those kind of things that come into play. And that reminds uh, me too that they, yep. they don't do all of yep. their learning face to face with us, that they take it home and many of them will follow their passions there. So we need to give them the tools that they can grab on and take home with them and go into more in depth study for their own personal interest. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so they do have activities for all ages and kind of different entry points. Um, the one they added this year, which was what uh, Gail's class and my class worked on, uh, was a whole series of um, kind of math related code games based on the movie Frozen. Um, I thought my students would kind of kick back on that a little bit, <laughs> you know, a little frozen overload. Um, but none of them did, which is really interesting. Um, and it has to do with creating fractals and other kind of mathematical uh, diagrams uh, uh, using coding to have the characters kind of skate on the ice and make uh, certain kind of uh, mathematical figures. Uh, and that's what uh, we were working on the other day when uh, Gail uh, kindergarten students and my sixth graders kind of teamed up and kind of worked together to see how far they could get in the time we gave them. Um, most of them, Gail, I think that's like level seven or eight out of 20, um, except mm -hmm. for that one yeah. team of boys who I think got close to 20. I, they didn't reach it, I think, but they were pretty far <laughs> along. I was surprised. Mm -hmm. Yes, they were fantastic. You know what I loved about it too, Kevin, though? Not only do I love the audio piece where you hear the skater crunching across the ice and they can hear that, um, but I love that when they made a mistake, the skater continued on and they saw a program that for some might actually be a hack that was their way of making their own thing out of something that was a given. And they learned by their mistakes in a very visual way. It was a really cool program. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I was I was actually just trying to see if anybody would see that and then say, oh, let's program this to make a, you know, whatever. But I don't know if any did. And of course, there were a lot of groups, so we didn't kind of couldn't look over the shoulder of every single group that were that was doing it. Um, I'm hoping somebody kind of saw that and hacked it a little bit. Um, mm. But uh, but I, I'm not quite sure. Um, but I will say that um, the idea of collaborating with another class, like we did, uh, across mm. different age levels, is always a really powerful experience for students in both groups. Um, my students, I know, uh, really had a, a fun time kind of working with your students. And some even said that you know they got pushed aside by your kids, who <laughs> 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 then took over the computer and were doing the programming, you know, with our sixth graders just kind of watching. Um, you know, and they were kind of laughing when they said that. You know, it was, it was funny. But I think that's that's part of that empowerment that they're getting out of your class there, and and of using the technology enough. You know, again, going back to the idea of agency, like, you know, your students have agency with those computers. They're not mm -hmm. scared of it. Um, they're willing to take chances and, and kind of do different things as well as being respectful as well. Knowing that Frozen was a challenging activity to do, I did insist that my students be the ones to turn on, to power down, to, to log into our own special login, um, to find the program for the older kids because I knew it was going to fall back on the older kids to carry most of the weight later in the, in the activity. So I appreciated you letting my kids do strut their stuff in the areas they're most confident. Yeah, no, that, that worked great. Um, you know, this morning I was working on uh, the activity they have of building your own Flappy Bird game uh, because I think that's oh, yeah. what we're going to be doing in sixth grade this week uh, as part of our kind of gaming unit is uh, uh, one of the tutorials has you construct your own Flappy Bird style game and then you can actually publish it uh, with a link uh, for others to play later on. So I think either on Monday or Tuesday um, that's going to be our activity is is having them kind of go through that and also connect it into the things we were talking about around game design and system learning too. So I'm interested in how that goes with our sixth graders and whether they can uh, construct a, an interesting Flappy Bird style game um, and then share it out and publish it and let other people play it. I would love to see that. Let me know if, um, if your class needs uh, an audience because my kids would love to be inspired by your kids. Okay, great. All right. Um, all right, I'm going to move on a little bit, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, I'll so. tell you about this one. Um, 
it's uh, there are code.org is offering at least three courses designed for students. These courses include some short videos on why we should learn to code and how coding can impact our lives. And then there are step-by-step -step directions and even some hints along the way when the students run into problems. Um, it takes a certain amount of risk taking and practice in order to become proficient and they do practice and recycle the earlier learning as they move through the levels. You have to work for it and many of the students um, and for many of the students this is their way into learning things. So course one is the lowest level. It's designed with the kindergarten first grade students in mind. Course two is rather designed for grades two to five, and course three um, is is for grades four and five. So those are the more challenging ones. But teachers of all grade levels can find practical applications for each of these courses. For instance, Frozen is created for more independent use at the course two or three level. But when an older student or adult shares the experience, as maybe on the interactive whiteboard or side by side as we did yesterday, even much younger students can enjoy it equally well. And I think too that um, it's important to talk about the unplugged kind of elements too. You want to do that, Gail? Yeah, sure. Um, and if you can look at the slide, I'm not sure you can see, but stage one has a unplugged activity to begin with. These are paper and pencil tasks or even just verbal tasks that you can do in the classroom that are following the direction. So if you look, stage one has um, has a, an unplugged uh, activity to start with, and then stage two has it. They all, uh, pretty much most of them have those activities. So you can find a way without any technology at all of jumping right in and making meaning for your own individual situation in the classroom. Yeah, and I think that really reinforces that idea of it's really a systems uh, element that we're talking about. And, you know, technology is one way that we can approach it, but, uh, you know, a systems idea thinking uh, goes across all different kind of spectrums. And I think those unplugged activities, uh, there's one, and somebody mentioned with the plastic cups, um, there's some where you program people walking and moving around the room, uh, can be really fun and interesting. Um, and it has to do with kind of thinking through the steps of an activity and what happens when you make changes to that, what happens to the final outcome. Um, so that idea mm -hmm. kind of pulls through in a lot of really interesting ways. Another interesting thing to point out is all of code.org is open source and it's all online and it's all ready for you to go get it as you're ready for it. Yeah. Okay, let's go uh, to the next slide. Um, so uh, when we think about, uh, again, this is just a screenshot of one of the activities. The, uh, this is the Angry Bird kind of activity. Um, and you can kind of look to the right there and see what the code looks like. It's, a, it's called Blockly. Um, and it's a kind of cousin of the Logos programming, uh, which is a drag and drop um, and then manipulate it. But what's really nice, too, is that once you kind of run your code, um, it allows you to kind of look at the actual programming language of the Blockly code itself. Um, so like when we were doing it in our classroom on our board, each time we did it, we pulled up um, what the actual code looked like and then talked through and kind of made comparisons between the kind of visual Blockly code and then the underlying actually written code. So they kind of start making connections between what they were seeing there um, in the kind of programming language as opposed to what they saw in the kind of visual element of it, which is a really kind of fascinating kind of bridge between the visual elements of technology and, again, what's going on under the hood. Um, certainly, we talked about Frozen and trying to make connections to pop culture. Um, you know, depending on the age of your kids, this may or may not be a draw. <laughs> uh, um, I do know, like, the Angry Birds and the Plants vs. Zombies is always a big hit with, uh, with my sixth graders, for sure. Um, and I haven't tried the Flappy Bird yet with them, so that'll be interesting to see how they kind of, um, how they get into that this year. And I know kids talk about it because they were kind of following the whole Flappy Bird flap uh, over uh, the developer pulling it from from iTunes uh, for the, from the store, the Apple Store, uh, for worries that it was too addicting and all those kind of things. And we've had discussions actually through the year about why somebody would do that. And um, you know, those are all really good entry points to talk about uh, technology and literacy and programming and all kinds of things. 
Um, these are some of the numbers from last year, and um, as Gail said, they're hoping to have a pretty sharp increase this year, and I guess, you know, we'll see. Um, you know, it's nice to see the numbers across the kind of world doing um, activities, and then, you know, um, really it's the kids in your classroom, though, that are most important, I think. Um, but it's good to get the scale of things as well. By the way, Gail and I are not organizers of our code at all. <laughs> we, um, <laughs> we're just kind of... Uh, uh, enjoy the opportunity and the work they put in it and are kind of using it as it seems fit for our classrooms as as you might do in your own classroom. Um, you know, this is a really important issue, I think, around technology, um, around gender equity, um, and thinking of girls in particular and how much access they have to uh, computer programming and coding and gaming. Um, and if you follow anything around the technology industry, you know in recent uh, months has been a pretty significant um, issue around um, gender equity. Um, so um, I know code.org does keep track of, um, of the gender of students engaged in the activities. Um, and mostly it's around that 50-50 split, I would say. Um, but I think as teachers and educators and you know, community members, it's something we really need to, to uh, keep track of. Um, so that um, girls are empowered as much as boys to kind of do the things that um, allow them access to the various literacy skills, uh, technology, um, creation, making, all those kind of things that the boys have access to, um, and, and make sure that we're kind of paying attention to those things. Uh, there's a question that Jackie has about, is it a 50 50 split in middle school and high school? I guess I'm not really sure. I've only seen the kind of overall numbers. So that's a pretty good question. I'm not sure. I wonder if it'd be different in high school, depending on clubs and stuff like that. But I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, moving on. Um, go ahead, Gail. Okay, so uh, we're not going to belabor this point, but some people will express some interest in knowing how to get started. So if you're going to be using tech tools, not the unplugged ones, but uh, using laptops or maybe you have iPads. We don't have iPads in our school, believe it or not, but um, we use some very old MacBooks. And so things you need to do is teach those young kids the basic skills, the fundamentals, how to turn it on, how to shut it off, how to operate and move the cursor around. Uh, direction keys are really important in most of the coding activities. Um, that my kids would be doing for any of the games we're playing online. A new tool for them that, frankly, I haven't taught uh, very much just through the code activities is using the delete and trash keys. Now, when you have kids working in close proximity to each other, you really do need headsets on. And that means they have to know how to take care of those headsets, as well as the laptops. We start out with some sanitary wipes and clean the keyboards off, but not the screens. And that way they learn um, that they are responsible for maintaining the, the equipment. Um, and then you're going to use baby steps. Absolutely, you're going to take tiny steps one after another. I like to present on the interactive whiteboard. Before I had an interactive whiteboard, however, I um, I used to have the I would have the kids huddled around me as I sat at a, a desktop, and I would perform the activity they were going to be using that day. And then um, they would go back and they would practice the one thing I taught them. If it was one activity, such as this is sand.com, they were able to do that for maybe 15 minutes. Then I said, let's take a break and let's learn how to move on to something else. As a rule, it was best not to introduce more than one top two things at a setting, uh, each setting, because um, that would be overload and it would drag the uh, computer time out too much. Again, we're talking kindergarten. Um, I expect to get a little more time out of older kids. These are B-Bots, and boy, are they awesome tools. Um, you can search for them online. I recommend you go right to the company source if you're interested in buying them. They use direction keys on top, and the kids program the B-Bot to move. There's blocks of wood that we have that have flowers on them. There's beehives. You can set up a course for the children to program the B-Bots through. In kindergarten, the programming was very, very simple. 
and they would not be able to do really elaborate things. But look at the joy on their faces. They are having a blast and they're working together. Our job as educators is to listen to the conversations, to hear the language they're using, to ask the probing questions, to say what if. And you acknowledge all of their great work and you lap them through their, their difficulty so that they don't take it too seriously. Uh, here are some boys using the bebop. Uh, again, I say take frequent breaks because if someone finds a great uh, finds great success, it's great to bring everyone in to watch that and reward with the personal res the uh, peer respect that they get. So uh, if you make mistakes as I do in um, my computer work, model that for the kids. Show them how it's okay and you're going to move on because we all need to move on and try again. Perseverance, that's, uh, that's gonna, what's going to get us through to the end of the game. Kevin? Okay. Uh, yeah, and one of the things that uh, I think is really important no matter what the age, including us adults, is um, you know, time to play. And I think um, students need that um, and adults need that too. And it's one thing a lot of professional development sessions don't allow for, I think, is that uh, dive in time, play around, mess around, uh, make things kind of happen, and then reflect on that whole experience. And as teachers thinking about, is this a learning experience or not? Uh, for students, it's what have I learned um, along the way? And so I think uh, when we're introducing whatever it happens to be, you know, either hour of code activities or whatever it happens to be that we need to budget that idea of time for playing around. I think it's really important. Uh, you know, one of the things that we do in our sixth grade is we do a video game design unit that we're in the middle of right now. And uh, it's a science-based video game project that they're working on right now. Um, this year they're, um, they're studying um, cells right now in science. So um, they're using the whole idea of uh, s cells as part of a metaphor uh, for a video game that they're constructing right now in uh, a site called GameStar Mechanic, um, which uh, if you're interested in exploring video game design, um, you know, I would highly recommend uh, taking a look at GameStar Mechanic. Uh, one of the things that's nice about it is that um, it teaches students how to do game design by having them make games. Um, and also the ability to publish games inside a closed um, community of students from around the world who then become their audience. Um, so it covers a lot of ground. Um, and for us, it's a collaboration between myself and our science teacher and also our um, special education department too, uh, where we um, co-teach co some classes for moving kind of game design right into our ELA class. And uh, these are just a couple of, um, of kind of elements around that. And uh, the other day I was asking my students whether they might be interested in participating in uh, the National STEM Video Game Challenge, uh, which happens um, in the spring. And, uh, you know, a lot of students are really interested in the idea of building a game for that audience, not necessarily for me as the person in the session in their games, uh, but for this national competition. And um, I've already seen that in the quality of the kind of work that we're doing around story framing out their games um, and building the games with, um, with scientific vocabulary kind of inside of it and uh, making it, from my standpoint, a learning adventure, uh, from their standpoint, um, a really engaged activity um, in a lot of different ways. And we tie it into this idea of coding because although they're not doing specific programming uh, with a programming language, uh, they certainly are constructing a video game that uses, again, that systems thinking, um, kind of built around the idea of uh, publishing their own video games. And that's pretty powerful for a sixth grader. Can we move on here. Um, these are just uh, a screenshot of some of the uh, games that were done last year. Uh, the last couple of years, uh, this unit has been around a geology unit, um, around uh, layers of the earth and volcanoes and, and um, tectonic plates um, and other elements uh, around geology. Um, this year, our science teacher switched over to doing cells this time of year, so we've had to kind of make some adjustments in that kind of curriculum, and I really wasn't sure how it would go, uh, but it's been really kind of a powerful experience to watch students talking now about all the vocabulary around cells as part of their gaming. Um, and these are all done in GameStar Mechanic. 
Yes. Um, and one of the nice things about GameStar Mechanic too is that along with when you publish games, they're inside the GameStar community. You can also embed them outside the community too. So like we will embed some of these um, in our classroom website to allow parents and community members to see what we've been up to um, and kind of think about gaming as literacy. Uh, you know, one of the things I've really been trying to think about over the years is uh, this idea of how does game design connect to literacy um, and thinking in terms of how we approach writing and writing process theory um, around game design theory too. And uh, if you look at this chart here, you'll see that there's actually a lot of overlap uh, between the approach, uh, some of the kind of some of the labels we put on here might be different, uh, but the idea of brainstorming, storyboarding out, uh, not just producing drafts, but producing prototypes, which is what we're into right now. Uh, they're just starting to work on the first levels of the game. Um, and gathering feedback from peers and trying to see what improvements need to be made, revising the game, uh, testing and retesting that prototype a few times. Uh, publishing the game and then looking at stacks of players who play the game and keep publishing updates as, ne as needed. Um, so that idea of kind of connecting in gaming to coding um, is part of what we're doing at this time of year. Wow, this has been an amazingly fast hour and we're running out of time. Um, but uh, we do want to get your coding ideas, so we'll say that. Let's move on because I know that a little bit later um, we're going to have a spot for questions. We hope we don't have much time. But please add any uh, links you want to share in the chat and, uh, and then uh, we can get them added to the live binder. I think that would be the best way to proceed, don't you, Kevin? Yes, it sounds great. Uh, one last thing, I guess. Uh, I think this is probably the only last slide, anyway. But um, is um, you know we think of coding beyond just the programming. Um, there's more and more of this movement of hacking for change and coding for good. Uh, more and more community groups are getting together uh, to come together to solve problems in their community. Um, so there's often uh, a national day of civic hacking, it's called, and hack for change. And we actually have a group in our area in Western Massachusetts that gets together, and they work with local hospitals and local governments uh, who present problems that they're facing. And the programmers and other people who are involved in uh, this hack for change and, and coding uh, help create programs and help create solutions uh, for solving problems uh, over the course of a day or two, uh, which I think is a really powerful way of how coding kind of builds into the community good and yet another kind of rationale of why we should be introducing it into our school day. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. So I guess we'll turn this back to Peggy and Lori uh, because I think these are your slides to wrap up our session. Thank you, Gail and Kevin. I did capture some questions from the chat as we were going. Uh, this was an early question. It might have gotten answered in the chat. Is there a difference between coding and programming? I can't touch that well, one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm not an expert either. Um, you know, I guess they're pretty similar. Um, I think uh, programming is kind of what you do. Um, and coding is the architecture of what it is, uh, if that kind of makes sense. Um, so I think they're really related, obviously. Uh, it, but, um, but coding is kind of what creates kind of the technology that we're using. OK. And the link for the book was published, was posted in chat after I copied the question. Uh, which do you recommend for low readers and beginners? I would recommend the course one in code.org. But I can also recommend some other activities that are using coding um, behaviors. Um, and those can be things that you find in abcia.com or other sites that are teaching literacy. Um, I happen to have a Symbolu web mix, um, and it's called Coding Games. You might be able to find it on Symbolu. But in that, I've got uh, some activities for rhyming, um, uh, for for rhyming, following maze activities. Um, 
other things that will help with their literacy work as well. So you can find those uh, using coding tools, but at the same time not on a specific program. In the meantime, I would definitely go with course one of code.org. Okay. And once they finish course one, is course two automatically opened up for them? That was the, the next question. It is not a progressive thing. You can jump from one course to the next. And we found that within course one was then just frozen. The kids could skip over the third level and jump up to level 18 if they want to. It's very <laughs> fluid. <laughs> OK. Um, any bandwidth problems with Hour of Code? This teacher tried it, and after a while, students couldn't connect. Mm -hmm. That is a school-wide uh, problem, isn't it, Kevin? Yeah, um, you know, we didn't run into problems, but um, different mm -hmm. parts of our building, I think, do have some connected problems. And um, yeah, uh, I think from what I've read, I mean, they've tried to take that into account as much as they can mm -hmm. uh, to make it a low threshold uh, for streaming. Uh, but I think that some schools, depending on their, their infrastructure, might, might run into problems. Um, and I guess uh, teachers should probably test it out as best they can uh, before they kind of bring it in. And I think it really points to the idea of access issues that mm -hmm. is huge in our country and other parts of the world, too. Um, about who has access to the technology and who has access to bandwidth, um, and um, you know what that does to um, the privileges of those schools that have it and, uh, and those who don't. So you know it's a bigger political issue, obviously. And yes. of course, Gail and I do not have the solution for that. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we don't have we don't have fiber optics on our building, so we don't have some fancy technology going on in that regard. But I have not run into any problems with the code.org activities because of bandwidth. Okay, and there were two suggestions in chat. One was to download the videos and run them locally rather than through the net. And the other was to stagger um, students on computers if possible. So not everybody's all on at the same time. So those are two suggestions that came yeah. in the in the chat. Um, That's a good one. And they, I just to say that um, with the videos, um, they also built in where um, part they partner up with the video is the text of the video. So if mm -hmm. you're because they're you I think the YouTube hosted videos. Yes, they are. I remember. So if you're blocked or can't have access, you can still kind of get screenshots and the text of what's in the videos um, as well. So. Um, I think they tried to think through that kind of, again, access issues uh, for mm -hmm. classrooms. Mm -hmm. Is there a way for students to save their work? No. Well, actually, I think there is. So I think so. teachers can create a teacher account, I believe. Um, uh, I haven't done it, and obviously Gil hasn't either. Um, but, um, and I think then students can actually um, kind of save within that, I believe. Um, and I think somebody else actually wrote about that in the chat room already. Yes, that's what um, you type. Yeah, if you have a teacher account, students' yeah. progress is saved. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't do that um, mostly because we're kind of bouncing kind of in and out. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, but it might be worth pursuing if that's something that you are imagining you're just going to keep coming back to and want to keep progressing on over the course of a, a number of days. Mm -hmm. But another point on that is my students are not logging in themselves. They're just mm -hmm. logging into the site as a general account that I have as a teacher. And it's a teacher account. But if they don't have their own identity. And you know, my kids don't have their own account. So no, it wouldn't be safe for them. And they're young. So Peggy asked this. There's an advantage to logging in. It remember, does it remember where you leave off? Um, I believe so. I think it saves your progress uh, through the different activities. Mm -hmm. I know that when we go to the website, it's everyone going there at the same time. And I know that the icon I have saved for them is my login. So they're all logged in as me. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it isn't saved. It starts all over each time. So I can't okay. answer it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and Wes is saying, you know, have students, if they can, log in with their own accounts for the activities so that, you know, they have agency over the kind of code that they're creating and doing. And that makes sense, I think, depending on your situation, I think. And this was a question that goes back to the B bots. What was the student bot ratio? 
for the we have, <laughs> um, we happen to have, I think it was a dozen of them. Mm -hmm. They were purchased with a grant many years ago. And uh, they sat in a box for a while. But somebody noticed them again. And I dragged them out. And they had a whale of a time with them. So um, it was, we happen to have 12, I'd say, that they were, it was two kids to one bee box. Mm -hmm. That might be a future okay. collaboration activity. Uh -huh. Okay, I think that those were the questions I was able to capture. We have a couple participants who'd like to share. Uh, Maureen, your hand's up first, and you already have the mic. So would you like to share your experiences with the Hour of Code? Sure, thanks. I just wanted to say I have the, all my kids from K through 6 signed up with their own accounts. I have a teacher dashboard. And signing the kids up is really easy. I just put their first and last names in. I mean, literally copy and paste off a spreadsheet. It's one click. And it populates a page for the kids with their own link. They click on their name. And for K and 1, they, click, they pick out their picture. They have a half a dozen different pictures. I printed out their login cards. And the kids just print out, uh, click on one name, click on their picture. For second and third graders, my kids um, have two secret words. Again, I printed out login cards for them. And fourth or sixth have Google accounts, so they just log in through those accounts. But the teacher dashboard is really helpful. The kids see their progress. I see their progress. And when the kids go skipping around, as they can do, I can see what they actually finished and did a beautiful job on. And I can see also see where they're just jumping around to check things out. So it's been really successful so far. And I'm really looking forward to next week. Great. Thank you, Maureen. That's helpful. Paula, you can go ahead next. Hello, everyone. This is Paula Noggle from New Orleans, Louisiana. I uh, had my fourth graders participate in the Hour of Code last year. And it was so successful. And it was so much fun to watch them work through the uh, lessons that were on the, the site. And my favorite part was sitting there watching them at physically moving their body because they're not even in fourth grade. They're not, not real great with left and right still. And then, of course, learning how many degrees are um, you know, 360 divided up into parts to make the turns was really interesting. So from that, they were so into what we were doing through the hour of code that they were begging for more. They kept saying, please, please, we need to. Um, really, really want, you know, we really, really want to do more of this. So I went to my principal and I asked if I could run an after school computer club, science club for them. Um, if, you know, if it wasn't any charge, it was free. Um, I did it uh, three days a week through um, January and February and took them through the 20 hour elementary um, set of lessons that you can find on the site. And then from there, um, we, they, you know, I, I had them do other things. They created websites in Weebly. They made Vokies. They made some um, video games on Scratch and different things like that. And basically, all I did was I showed them the tool and said, I don't know much about it. You're going to be teaching. We're going to be teaching each other. And to watch some of the, the kids who are very, computer literate and maybe not so great in um, regular classroom environment shine through the, this um, computer science club was really great to see. One little guy just became like the hero of the computer science club because he just could do everything. And he just was you know, our superstar. And so he became the man on campus that everybody wanted to go to when they had any questions. So you know, it gives kids a different, a different way for an outlet for them. 
So definitely worth it. And please don't be fearful of it. Just let your kids have at it and see what happens. I think that empowerment that you talk about is really, you know, I see that a lot with the technology we do where um, students who may not be strong in some different areas suddenly emerge as the leaders of the classroom and everyone's turning to them for advice. I see that a lot with our gaming in particular. Um, you know, we have um, inclusion classrooms and some of the students that we have that struggle in a lot of different areas, um, I mean, this is their area of strength that they pull into the classroom and um, you know, we try to keep that positive engagement moving through other, you know, into other academics as well. But it's a great, it's a great moment to see. Thanks so much, Paula. Wes, you're up next. Well, we're going a little bit late, but this has been a great show. Thank you guys so much for doing this. Uh, West Fryer in Oklahoma City. Uh, just a couple things. I definitely encourage everybody to have your kids log in with their own code.org accounts, and you can create those unless it's changed on code.org slash join, uh, or that's, I think that's where the students create. You create your teacher account, and then when you go to, um, the students go to code.org.join, and just like um, an Edmodo, or you can use enrollment codes for KidBlog or other things, you get like a six-digit code, and students don't need their own email address. I've got 300 fourth and fifth graders each semester, and so they were able to put in this enrollment code, and the beautiful thing, and I bet it's even better than it was last year, is I could reset their passwords if they forgot them. But they really made some enhancements to the site, and you can see your, own, your students' activity and what they've done, and what warms my heart you know, more than anything with code.org is when I see that kids are independently continuing to work on modules and successfully um, you know, uh, complete levels on their own at home or, or somewhere else. And so that's, that's a really cool thing, uh, similar in the way that Khan Academy lets you, you know, track and follow your students. And the last thing I'd say real quick is, if you have iPads, uh, the uh, Scratch Junior was mentioned, but Hopscotch is the app that we've really used a lot the last two years. They've also enhanced that program, so there's a community for, for sharing apps and for kids being able, they call it branching, which is remixing when you download the app. Um, and just a quick story, my kids play a game when we're lined up sometimes that our PE teacher, uh, I guess, kind of made up called Carousel, and you call out something like, who has um, a logo on their you know, shirt, or who's wearing red, or something like that, and they go to the end of the line. Well, um, I've been working on making a game of that in Hopscotch, and you know, the first for a few versions were really pretty bad, um, but uh, just spent a couple hours at last weekend or the weekend before last um, really improving it. And, and so it's a great environment that's free if you've got iPads, not only for your kids, but for you to do this as well and to model you know, the iterative play and discovery that can happen with coding and seeing that, yeah, it's okay that it's not so great, but we're just going to keep working at it and getting it better and, uh, you know, being able to learn. And my kids have really enjoyed that. And, uh, you know, I've got several kids that are using Hopscotch on their own um, when they can have access to iPads. So definitely check that stuff out. Thank you guys for a great session today. Thanks, Wes. Yeah, good points about iterative play and iterative learning too. I think um, that is a, a, a fundamental part of thinking about um, technology across all sorts of different uh, platforms and, and hopefully those platforms have that built in. So that idea of branching out, I think that's the same terminology they use as Scratch, is that right? I can't remember. Um, but that idea of kind of building off what other students have done is really a powerful experience. Thank you everybody for the wonderful contributions and ideas. <clears throat> I'm going to jump on here real quickly because I know we've gone over time, but I want to definitely say a huge thanks to Kevin and Gail for everything that they inspired today. And I know that we all have tons of resources now to continue to explore well after today. So thank you both. And thanks to all of you that shared so freely in the chat. We have some amazing new resources to add to the Live Binder. So this is going to be a great one-stop shopping place for all of us. 
Hope you'll come back to some of our future shows. Next week we have Steven Anderson with us, and he's going to be telling us about Class Flow, which is an amazing free resource for teachers. Then we'll be taking a break for a couple of weeks, and we'll be back for our anniversary celebration, six years on Classroom 2.0 Live, and that will be January 10th. Then we have the team from Symbaloo coming to give us all kinds of updates on the new features in Symbaloo on January 17th. And I do want you to know about the upcoming Student Technology Conference. <clears throat> This is a brand new conference, and I bet there are a lot of you here in the room right now who have students that could be presenters at this conference. It's being organized by students for students. It's going to be an online event Saturday, January 31st. So we won't have a show that day because we want to be part of this, and I think you're going to want to too. So we have a deadline coming up um, I, in, in a short time. I can't remember off the top of my head. I'll find it. But for submitting those presentation proposals, it's just opened up, so you have plenty of time to do this. So please think about doing that. And don't forget about the learning revolution. One stop shopping from Steve Hargadon for all of the fantastic um, virtual conferences that are free to all of us. Be sure to check that out. And Lori, take it over. Thanks, Peggy. You can nominate a featured teacher for the month at this site, tinyurl.com slash cr20live featured teacher nominate without the E at the end. You can nominate yourself as well for a featured teacher for the month. When you exit the show, your browser should open the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. Uh, if it does not, you can take the survey link from the whiteboard. And in addition, in the Live Binder, there's a link for the, the survey as well. So there are three different places to get the survey link. When you complete the survey about today's show, at the very bottom you'll find two fields to enter your, your email address and name for a professional development certificate. Please make sure that email is a personal email rather than a school email because this a lot of times gets blocked by school mail accounts. The archives are available at iTunes U in a video collection as well as an audio collection. And you can get an RSS feed of the recordings through a link on the site for RSS feeds if you have a feed reader on your computer or mobile device. Um, then you get the archives directed to you. So there are many places to go get the recording. This link happens to be for the full show recording. Special thanks again to Gail and Kevin, our special guests today for Hour of Code, to Steve Hargadon for the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website as well as to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much to, for coming. <laughs>